Welcome to another uh, session of the Worlds of Speculative Fiction. So we started out with uh, Poe, and now we've got Chesterton. We're looking into people that were big influences on, on some of the other thinkers that we looked at before. I've got, uh, uh, we're doing an innovation this time. I actually put the, some of the themes that I thought would be interesting to talk about on the, the board, uh, since we've had that this entire time. <laughs> never used it. Uh, I thought maybe since I actually had my marker along, it would be a good idea. Uh, as usual, I've got a, um, you know, some, some quotes for you and uh, a timeline. And Chesterton is somebody who um, I, I actually encountered kind of late. I, I didn't start reading him until I was in graduate school. But I'd heard of him because everybody mentions him and says, oh, he's such a great essayist and uh, loves paradox and um, su such an interesting guy in certain ways. And, and it was people that who I, I liked who were, who were talking about him, you know, like uh, Jorge Luis Borges or C.S. Lewis or J.R. Tolkien <coughs> um, referring to him. So I thought, um, I better read him. And I, I can't, we were talking about used books. I, I bought a used copy of um, The Man Who Was Thursday and read that. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. So then I started buying up other things, including, I, I remember I bought this in, in Carbondale as well, this, this uh, Everlasting Man at the same used bookstore. And then I went on, a, after I finished graduate school, I went on a Chesterton jag, where, you know, that's like where you read everything you can by the person. And then I, I got kind of, you know, I read enough to get tired of them. So I let it alone for a while, but I'd, co I'd go back to it every so often. And I, I, I really do enjoy him. Um, he has been a massive influence on, on lots of people um, who we've, we've looked at. Um, as I mentioned, um, C.S. Lewis talks about him. Um, Tolkien is actually influenced to some degree by his uh, you know, social theory. that he, he wasn't the only person, but he's, he's one of the main people with, um, dis, is it, what is it? I always get, get the word wrong, Dis, distributism. Uh, I always want to say distributivism. But, um, you know, he, he's, he's probably still in, uh, casting a, a big shadow, and a big shadow because he was also a big fat guy too, um, all the way down to the present. He, and he was a, a big fat guy who was fine joking about his weight. You, you know that joke about the, uh, uh, he, in World War I, this woman asked him, why aren't you out at the front? And he said, man, if you go around to the side, you'll see that I am. <laughs> he, was, he was a tall guy. Uh, they say somewhere between 6'2 and 6'4, probably around you know, 280, 300 pounds. So. Did he know Lewis and Tolkien? Or I'm, I've forgotten where, when they were born. Well, they're, they're um, somewhat later. They're a different generation. OK, so he didn't know them? Or, I mean, or... No, I don't think so. Um, but. Um, and, and there's other writers, too, before him that, that, you know, he would have read and been influenced as well by, like, like John Henry Newman, for example. He was, a, Chesterton was a contemporary with, like, George Bernard Shaw, who he was very good friends with and would fight with all the time. There's actually a, a movie that never got released with the two of them in it. Um, uh, he would debate people. He's like a contemporary of Bertrand Russell as well. He would debate him sometimes. Um, so, yeah, he, and, and he dies kind of young. I mean, not surprisingly, congestive heart failure. Um, when, you're, when you're overweight, that sort of thing can, can quite easily happen to you. So he's born in 1874, and he's, you know, he's the kind of guy who he travels a lot in, in his life, but he's really a Londoner, and he, he stays in that, that area for the most part. Um, he goes to schools, and then he uh, goes to this Slade School of Art, um, starts doing some writing, art criticism, um, wants to be an artist, uh, doesn't graduate from there. He, he actually leaves there and starts working for this publisher, Redway, and then uh, quickly shifts from them to one uh, T. Fisher Unwin that, that was kind of an important press at the time, and then he starts freelancing. And this guy was really prodigious when it comes to his output. If you think about the amount of writing that he did, he starts writing art and literary criticism, um, and then eventually he starts branching out. And, and you notice, like, at, at certain times, they give him weekly columns. Um, well, that means you have to write an essay a week. And essays are, I mean, tough to write as it is, 
But to do it week after week after week after week consistently, um, that, that's quite tough. He also meets this, this woman, Frances Blog. Um, they don't marry for quite a while, five years, in part because in order to get married, you actually had to have some money. And, uh, you know, it's not like today where they'll, they'll give you a license, you know, just walk into the courthouse. Um, you needed to have some prospects, and he wasn't, he wasn't financially solvent enough for, for quite a while. But apparently it was one of those love at first sight sort of things for, for him. And she was quite brilliant herself. Um, she ended up, in many respects, taking a kind of traditional support role. She, she handled, for example, his bookings. So there's a famous story of him telegramming to her and saying, I'm, I forget exactly where I'm at this station. Where am I supposed to be? You know? <laughs> so sort of like we would you know, look at our phone to figure out where we were supposed to be. That's what he's doing with her. Um, but he had some, somewhat of an intellectual and, and you know, certainly uh, affectionate equal in her. He writes for this, this, uh, this thing, the speaker, um, and, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll say this, too. A lot of people, including myself, because Chesterton was, was a Catholic by the time that he dies and, and during some of his, his writing period, I just assumed he was a Catholic his whole life, the way that he, he writes about things. But he wasn't. He was a Anglican, um, you know, from a family that was kind of, you know, uh, laissez-faire about... Uh, what that meant, but Anglicanism is kind of a, a mishmash anyway that way. It's kind of like a big big umbrella term. And he was always very interested in traditional religion. Uh, he eventually becomes what you'd call uh, an Anglo-Catholic, which is the Anglicans who are more influenced by, by the, the Catholics, which is kind of, in, in, you know, here in America, not that big of a deal. Um, but in Britain, you know, they were really looked down upon. I mean, in, in the early days in America, Catholics were really quite despised. Um, and, and they could be even in, in some areas. But, um, you know, by, by the time that, that, that he's there, there's still kind of an opprobrium to being, being a Catholic in, in England. And so I assumed he was Catholic the whole time, but he wasn't. He, he slowly moves his way into it. Uh, in a lot of ways. And he's, and he's influenced by documents by Catholics before he's a Catholic. So this whole distributivism, th distributism thing, it's coming out of, you know, uh, like the Pope writing Rerum Novarum in, in the 1800s. Um, Chesterton's not actually converting until long after he's already sort of thought this. this he's 48, through. yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he was actually a lay, lay preacher in St. Paul's Church, so he's, he's talking, you know, he, there is an Anglican. And you notice he's, I, 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 most of the people that we, we look at, I don't put all their books in there. I've got most of his, his books in here, just so you can get an idea of the, the literary output and the range of Chesterton. Some of it is, you know, stories like, like these, right? The Ball and the Cross or The Flying In or Man Who Was Thursday. Some of them are selections of short stories. There's, of course, the Father Brown stories, um, you know, which all, all detectives with, with this Father Brown guy who's based on a real-life person. Um, and then there's poetry. He wrote a ton of poetry. He wrote a lot of essays. He wrote some books like, like these two, you know, specifically on a particular topic, um, uh, you know, discussions of the Gospels, his views on, on orthodoxy itself. Um, he, he also wrote a lot of um, literary criticism. So you notice, like, uh, for example, in 1903, he, it must have been a, a really good year for him. He turns out a book on Robert Browning, Charles Dickens, Tennyson, Thackeray, Leo Tolstoy. I'll admit, I haven't read these, these uh uh, literary biographies. I'm not. I'm not that that interested in that sort of stuff compared to uh, the, the, the sort of books that I have here um, and the essays. But he's you know he's good at that, and he keeps on doing those. Those were probably I would imagine good money makers too. You know. Um, so as he's he's going on, he's he's writing. He starts writing uh, weekly columns. He meets this guy, Father John O'Connor who will be the model for, for Father Brown. We'll talk about why that matters in a bit. Um, and then eventually in the 1910s, they get this, he and his brother Cecil, who's younger than him, and Hilaire Belloc 
get this um, distributivism, distributism um, project off and, and running. And they start publishing uh, a series of papers, um, each one of which like sort of folds up and starts a new one. Um, and, and, and the whole idea is to have a new social theory that's not conservative, it's not liberal, it's not uh, a communist, it's not capitalist, it's something, it's a, it's a different alternative that would um, be, you know, a full, sort of fuller exemplification of social justice. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, when the war comes, uh, of course, he's, um, he's a bit older, but his brother Cecil enlists in the army, um, in the infantry, and converts to Catholicism. Uh, his brother also gets married at the time to uh, a woman who appears, I forget, I think her name was Ida. She kind of trades on the Chesterton name a good bit because Chesterton's kind of famous by this time. Cecil ends up dying in France. Um, and uh, shortly after that, um, Chesterton is, is doing his first lecture tours. He goes to Palestine, which was under British control at that time, and to Italy. Um, then he goes to America. He's doing that from 21 to 22. Uh, well, that should be Helen Keller, not Hegel Keller. But it's Helen Keller, Ernest Hemingway. Um, and at the end of that year, he, he converts to Catholicism, and he's received into the church by that priest, Father O'Connor. Um, Was he married then? Or? Yeah, he, he got married in, where is this, uh, 19... Uh, 1901. No, sorry. Uh, well, that's all right. It, yeah. it, it, that's funny. His wife converts four years later. Um, See, and that's what I was wondering about, um, you know, Tolkien and Lewis, because they were yeah. converted too, but I didn't know, have any idea whether... Later on, yeah, yeah. they were in the 40s. No, but was there a literary group that were sort of oh, doing well, this? So, so, I, so um, Tolkien was Catholic. And he didn't convert? Like no, Lewis? no. No, but Lewis, I mean, Lewis uh, did convert. Right. Um, and Tolkien and Lewis are at, uh, they're at the university, right? Chesterton's not a university guy. He's a journalist guy. He always bills himself as a journalist. So okay. they're, you know, it, it, you could say in a, in a literary way, they're all in the same big soup, right? But they're not, they're not in the same place. Um, so, and that probably... Today, that wouldn't make that big of a difference, would it? Because we have, you know, uh, we're, we're so connected. But back then, that would, that would actually be quite important, not, not being in that uh, Oxford-y, you know, uh, um, environment. So, and then, you know, like I said, his, his wife um, converts about four years later. Um, he becomes president of the Distributist League. Uh, he visits Poland. Um, he visits Rome there. He, it's quite interesting. He interviews Mussolini, and he also has an audience with the Pope, so you know, he's got a lot of pull by then. And then he goes on his second American lecture tour um, in, in 1930, so right at the you know, start of the Depression. Um, and shortly after that, he's invited by the BBC to give a first set of radio talks. And this is you know, when radio is really taking off. Um, and at first he's kind of uh, reticent to do it, but then he, like everything else, he throws himself into it, and he starts giving about 40 talks a year. Um, and he does that until he dies. Now, 40, you know, 40 talks a year doesn't sound like that much, but, I mean, think about like putting out 40 podcasts a year, really good podcasts. That would be a lot of work. That's um, a week. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even if you've got other people doing all the editing and stuff, mm -hmm. right? You've got to have cogent thought. And with that, those radio talks, it's not like uh, you, you just, um, you could just get out and, and wing it and they'll edit the bad stuff out. You're on the radio. <laughs> you know? So. Rambling, maybe you can give the same talk, you know? <laughs> well, that's the other thing, though. You've got to give a different talk each week, right? You can't just uh, regurgitate the same material. I mean, th he had so much material by that time, anyway. I mean, he traveled everywhere. So, I mean, he could say, oh, this week I'm going to talk about when I met Missoula. True, you know yeah. I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and to, to write the amount of stuff that he, he wrote, just the because he this entire time while he's doing doing all this, he's still keeping up the you know one weekly column, so he's writing essays in, and you know I I I I've had a hard time 
uh, keeping up just sometimes with my blog. Um, and uh, I keep the, the pressure pretty low on the, the quality of the literary output for that. Um, he must have had some pretty high expectations for himself. Um, and notice he's still like churning out books this entire time too. A lot of years, you know, two or more books. Um, and eventually, you know, he, he dies of, uh, of congestive heart failure. But he writes his autobiography at just the right time, doesn't he? <laughs> it's his last year of his yeah. life. Um, I mean, that's it, kind of kind of an interesting point to, to, to end that, that timeline on. Um, if you were going to write your autobiography, wouldn't it make the most sense to do it shortly before you are dying? Yeah, then you don't miss anything. It, well, not only that, you don't have to do a second volume, right? Um, don't have to listen to the critics who say that was bullshit. That's a, that's a good point, too. Yeah. You don't have to answer anybody's questions. Yeah. What did you mean by this thing over here? Okay, those are, those are good points. So, um, I, you know, we, we usually talk about world building, and, and we can certainly do that with Chesterton. I mean, his, his world is generally this world only viewed through the eyes of the characters and revealed quite often as richer than, than at first looks, right? Um, so the man who is Thursday, you know, there is a bit of fantasy stuff in there, I'd say. But for the most part, what's happening is um, people are, are explaining what's going on, and this ties in with some of these themes. Um, what we first see... In, in the world, you know, usually viewed through the eyes of the characters and, and through dialogue, never turns out to be exactly what really is the case. Uh, that's always revealed through further action and further dialogue. And it's a world that we're used to of, um, you know, people who are on the make and people who are trying to earn a living and people who are, you know, exercising power and people who are in, in desperate circumstances. Um, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't set his stuff in, in some mythical past or anything like that. But I think it's because he thought this world was already magical enough, um, or there was enough of a, a perme permeation of the world, uh, the sort of materialistic, humdrum daily world by whatever you want to call it, the supernatural, the miraculous, the the, the dazzling. Um, I think that's that's part of what was going on. I mean. You've, you've read Chesterton. Do you think there's anything more to say about his world building? Or? Well, I, I only read The Man Who Was Thursday because I couldn't What'd find anything else. Um, that's the only one I could find. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually, I actually kind of like I think it could bear a second reading. I do. There's, there's, yeah. there's so much in there. Um, you know, I mean, it almost seems like a dream state. Like you said, nothing is what it is. Yeah, yeah. That, that the character of Sunday really could use some study because is he really the master? And none of these are, you know, the, the whole concept of anarchy as being, you know, a thing of the rich as opposed to the poor. The poor, they just uprise, but the anarch, the true anarchists who want to just bring down everything yeah. are the, the rich like and powerful. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and this Thursday, you know, going from the big fat man head, and then j just just the characterization of him with his head, and he just keeps going like he's almost a supernatural sort of thing. Yeah. And, with but Sunday, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sunday, the character of that. And, and he's, he's very elusive all the way through you just never really know what this is i mean you can figure out immediately that all these guys are caught i mean they're all with their with their things but the, you, the world you, you caught on right away that they were all cops well yes i, I was i was I, I was that was actually my, one of my favorite parts of the book is when they all realize that they're all cops all undercover checking up on each other and they've totally been wasting their time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, but I, I yeah, I, I could, after the second one, it, it, it just, after Tuesday, you know, the Polish oh, guy, okay. I can't think of the name, and then I started to think, okay, there's a theme going on here. Yeah. And then the last one with the secretary, they're really, you know, they're trying to stop the bomb and all this. I said, this is, yeah, he is too. So, um, yeah, that I, I read a lot of mysteries, so that I'm pretty good at that. So anyway, but it, it just, it was very, like, was this a dream? Like, in the end, he's, walk, he's Syme is walking with that, um, the fellow who started him. Gregory. Gregory, yeah. the actual anarchist, and was, I, I just thought, I really need to read this again, because it was, um, yeah, it was a lot you know, of paradox, you know, and it's, I would and it's, say. And it's called a nightmare. 
So yeah. is it a fantasy work? Um, I mean, it, it, nightmares are kind of dream, right? So Well, it was like Syme didn't even know if he had experienced this, if it was a dream. It seemed like he, he was talking with Gregory to say, you know, what is really, yeah. you know. And it was like a paradox. I mean, there's a lot of paradox. I that. will say, like, so that notion of things being a dream, so the ball and the cross, you have um, these two characters, both of whom are Scotsmen, and both of whom are very uh, grounded in a certain way, but also kind of crazy, but they're less crazy than the whole world around them. One is an atheist, and he's the kind of atheist who takes atheism seriously. He, he owns a shop, and he like, publishes atheist tracts. And then you have the other guy who's from Scotland, and we normally think of the Scots as being Protestants, right? Mm -hmm. But there, there was this remnant of Catholics. Oh, the, the Highlanders were all Catholic? Yeah, the, ja the Jacobites, the, the Jacobites, right? Jacobites, yeah. And so he's one of them, and he comes down to London, and he sees the guys. Um, he's, he's there to see the, the cathedral, and then he sees uh, this guy's shop, and he sees a tract about Mary just be being essentially uh, a re remix of a, a Sumerian or Babylonian goddess, and he breaks the guy's window and challenges him to fight. So then they get brought before the magistrate, and um, the magistrate just wants to smooth all this out. And the Scots, the, the Scotsman who's the Highlander, he's like, "I'm going to fight this man no matter where." And and, and the, the judge is like, that's, that's, "Come on, you're you're really being a pain, you know, being a stickler about this." And then eventually the, the atheist says, I won't fight him. Don't worry about it, Your Honor. Just let us go, right? <laughs> so they go out, and then the Scotsman turns to him, and he says, or the, the, I mean, the Scotsman turns to the other Scotsman and says, okay, where and when do you want to fight? <laughs> and that's the, the whole rest of the story is them attempting. They, they manage to, to steal two swords, mm -hmm. and they're going to duel to the death because it really matters. And everything around them, at one point, they actually say, I think we're, I actually have this in the quotes here, yeah. So there's, um, in the ball and cross, they're having one of their many discussions, and um, uh, the first one says, Mr. Turnbull, I have nothing to add to what I've said before. It's strongly borne in upon me that you and I, the sole occupants of this runaway cab, this is early on, are at, the two mo at this moment the two most important people in London, possibly in Europe. I've been looking at all the streets as we went past. I've been looking at all the shops. I've been looking at the churches. At first, I felt a little dazed with the vastness of, of it all. I could not understand what it meant, but now I know exactly what it means. It means us. This whole civilization is only a dream. You and I are the realities. And then uh, Mr. Tur Turnbull, the atheist, says, Religious symbolism does not, as you are probably aware, appeal ordinarily to thinkers of the school to which I belong. But in symbolism as you use it in this instance, I must, I think, concede a certain truth. We must fight this thing out somewhere because, as you truly say, we have found each other's reality. We must kill each other or convert each other. I used to think all Christians were hypocrites, and I felt quite mildly towards them, really. But now I know you're sincere, and my soul is, is mad against you. In the same way you, you used, I suppose, to think all atheists thought atheism would leave them free for immorality. And yet in your heart you tolerated them entirely. Now that you know I am an honest man, and you are mad against me as I am against you, that's it. You can't be angry with bad men, but a good man in the wrong, why one thirsts for his blood. Yes, you offer open for me a vista of thought. And so the idea is that the people who are really committed to something, in a certain way they're more real, and the rest of it's all just kind of BS that people you know juggle around and shift around, but it doesn't really matter, you know? Um, it's, it's all kind of fake. Um, and so it's not quite a dream, but, it, but it's kind of similar to that, that dream state. I this think, is that alternate reality kind of thing. Is that kind of what it just seemed like, too, that oh, yeah. there's this reality that In which exists. anarchists do weird and then, stuff. Yeah, and, and then, yeah. then there's this alternate kind of reality where everybody's in a disguise, nobody is who they are. Yeah. Um, and that reality kind of, you know, kind of superimposed. I, I don't know. It was just, like I said, I think it could bear a second reading just because there was a lot of, of um, you know, like I think there's influence when he was at that art school. I think he, oh. some of that was influencing Okay, there. yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. And um, a couple of other things that I, I yes. was, when I was reading, after I read this, I thought, yeah, I could see some of the stuff was coming through. I mean, you know, that's a good, that's a good point. Some it's, of his uh It's a pretty philosophy. early book, you know. Yeah. 
Uh, so it's not that far out of art school. I was, well, I, you know, yeah. they, they made a reference to a telephone. I thought, were they even have telephones in 1908? But I think yeah. they were very rudimentary. And cars, you know, they would have been very rudimentary cars. But even the people who were, like when they were when they're on the run from the so-called you know secretary of the things. But anyway, when they're on yeah. the run in the cars and, and then and then the, the professor knew all these guys and these guys were all going to help him, but the guys were all anarchists too. And it was just like this whole massive world of deception. And then Simon is just trying to you know wheedle through all of this. And it was you know I just thought it was you know his hiring is kind of funny with that too because so he's he's you could say he's he's like a detective right. Mm -hmm. He's an undercover guy. But he's, he's all law and order, and he's very spiritual. I mean, there's a whole lot of spirituality. Or well, and, and, and the assignment, story. he doesn't know yeah. who's actually giving him the assignment. And it, it's, you know, he's like, I don't, I'm not actually qualified for this, but you're qualified enough, you know. What am I supposed to do? Well, you'll figure it out, you know. Well, that, was, that was the big, dark-headed man that might have been Sunday later on, you know, because yeah. he said, I'm the man in the dark and shadows. And yeah. Uh, yikes, I mean, the whole thing with the elephant running around in the balloon, I mean, it was just so <laughs> out there. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and in a way, I mean, is this absurdist literature? There was a lot so? of absurd, very absurd in there. I don't know if it's quite as absurd as actual absurdist literature, but it definitely was there, almost like a children's book in some of Yeah, the, there okay. was an element of the absurd in quite a few of the, of the like, scenes. Well, it's sort of like Lewis Carroll, right? Where um, throwing really, stuff yeah. in or... Yeah. Not well... That was more satirical absurdity, where this is just, I don't know. Chesterton's certainly satirizing a lot of people. He, he, yeah, a lot of his, he, his people are yeah. kind of stand-ins for ideas that are prevalent at the time. Again, uh, it, it, to talk about the ball and the cross. So these guys, they want to fight, and they're prevented over and over again from fighting. Like The, the police won't let them fight. They want, to, they want to lock them up. And one of the first things that they do... <laughs> These two philosophers that they meet, and and the the chapters are actually um, called something like the first philosopher and the the second philosopher. Let me see here, uh, the peacemaker and the other philosopher. So they meet a like a Tolstoyan kind of guy, who's like, oh, we have to be nice to each other. Let's not fight. And um, the the two before that, the two men are getting to know each other, and they're getting closer and closer, like not fighting. And then the Tolstoyan guy comes in, and he's like, we have to be gentle, we have to be nice, we have to be meek. And they're like, well, I'm ready to fight now, you know, because this guy's <laughs> full of it, you know. And then they, 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 the cops are after them. They go to another place. There's another guy who's like, oh, I'll let you fight all you want because I'm – he doesn't use the word Nietzschean, but I think it's a Nietzschean mm -hmm. reference. He's like, you know, everything is about um, force, and blood, and I just love, I'll, I'll do anything to make it possible for you to fight. And the guy's talking and talking and talking. And so finally, Ian, who's the, the, the Catholic, he grabs the other sword and he puts it in the guy's hand. He said, fine, fight me. And the guy's like, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to fight. I want to see you guys fight. <laughs> you know? yeah, and he chases them defend away. Defend their truth to see whose truth it is. You know? Yeah, but well, the point is the, the second philosopher is a great windbag about how you know, everything is brutality, but he's not willing to actually step up and fight. Mm -hmm. He just wants to watch other people do it. You know, so I, there's a lot of satirizing of yeah. other people in this. So I, you know, that, that's that's quite true. Well, let's talk about the paradox thing. So I actually. Um, had a few things about paradoxes that I thought could be interesting. Um, Chesterton is called the Prince of Paradoxes. Uh, sometimes it can get a little tiresome, I think, um, how everything can be twisted and turned, but he is quite good at doing it. Um, so here's something he says in Orthodoxy. <clears throat> Mere light sophistry is the thing I happen to despise most of all things, and it's perhaps a wholesome fact this is the thing of which I'm generally accused, I know, something, I know nothing so contemptible as a mere paradox, a mere ingenious defense of the indefensible. If it were true that, George, that Mr. George Bernard Shaw lived upon paradox and he ought to be a mere common millionaire for a man of his mental activity could invent a sophistry every six minutes, it's as easy as lying because it is lying. The truth is that Mr. Shaw is cruelly hampered by the fact that he cannot tell any lie unless he thinks it's the truth. I find myself under the same intolerable bondage. So what he's saying there is there's two kinds of paradoxes. There's like the glib, easy to come up with paradox where you just like twist something on its head. Like people do this with, with what's called the rhetorical device of chiasm, the, the crossing, 
where somebody will say, um, you know, you shouldn't um, cheat your spouse. And then he might say, yes, but should you espouse cheating? And it sounds very <laughs> profound, right? You're just twisting it around. Right. There's actually a really funny scene in uh, a super, like a spoofing superhero movie where there's this guru who everything that they say, he just twists it around like that. And then after a while, they catch on. And they're like, you're full of it, you know. Um, you, you don't actually know anything. So that's, that's a, a superficial kind of paradox. So what is a, a deeper paradox? It's a paradox about things that actually looks at how strange they really are when we, when we look at them more closely. And so I, I, here's, here's one example. I'll just skip over the um, reforming thing. Uh, we can come back to that in a bit. The one from The Everlasting Man. He's talking about people and, and what they have to say about the contrast between Jesus of the church and Jesus of the gospels. He says, we've all heard people say a hundred times over, for they never seem to tire of saying it, that Jesus of the New Testament is indeed a most merciful and humane lover of humanity, but the church has bidden this human character in repellent dogmas and stiffened it with ecclesiastical terrors till it's taken on an inhuman character. And he says, this is almost the, the reverse of the truth. Because if you actually read the Gospels, this guy's scary as hell. He's saying stuff, you know, in these, these, these parables himself, um, and he's, he's very cut and dry. There's the goats, there's the sheep, um, you know, there's so many things that you're not supposed to do. That's in the Gospels. That's the Jesus that, that actually gets, gets recorded. So he says, um, it's the uh, image... Uh, the truth is the image of Christ in the churches is almost entirely mild and merciful. It's the image of Christ in the Gospels that is a good many things as well. The figure in the Gospels it, it utters in words of almost heartbreaking beauty his pity for our broken hearts. But they're very far from being the only sort of words he, entered, he utters. They're almost the only kind of words that the church and its popular imagery ever represents in his uttering. And so he says it makes sense, right, that the poor are broken. The mass of the people are uh, poor, and the mass of, for the mass of mankind, the main thing is to carry the conviction of the incredible compassion of God. But nobody with his eyes open can doubt that it's chiefly this idea of compassion that the popular machinery of the church does seek to carry. The popular imagery carries a great deal to access the sentiment of a gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And, it, you know, if you look at the Gospels, this guy is like telling rich people, well, you're not, going, you're not going to heaven, and if you're not going to heaven, you're going to hell, right? It's easier for, especially in the Gospel of Luke, right? It's easier for, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Imagine if you're rich and, and you hear that. Or, he had no taste for hypocrisy. I mean, he just yeah. laid it right out there, you know? Well, or, or think of the young rich man, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The young rich man who actually, like, follows all the commandments and does everything that he's supposed to do and seems to be motivated by love and he goes to this Jesus guy uh, who, you know, at this point in time has not been ratified as the son of God or anything and he says, hey, I, you know, teacher, I've done all the stuff I'm supposed to do and he says, oh yeah, okay, cool. Uh, sell everything you got, give it to the poor and follow me. And then the young man goes away unhappy and I think if you, if you think about it, yeah, of course he goes away unhappy because he just he's been doing everything and he's being expected to like do this other crazy stuff. Um, so that's kind of a paradox, right? Now, why is it? This goes to the the sort of appearance and reality thing. Why is it that people have these these mixed up ideas and would say, "Oh, it's the church that's got the mean Jesus." We just got to go back to the Gospels and find the the real nice Jesus. It would be because they don't actually look at things closely. They don't read the Gospels. Because if they did, they would see that it's full of statements like that. Oh, you know, you're angry with your brother, you're liable to the judgment. You know, I say if you, you know, even look at a woman with, with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. This guy is like raising the bar way up here. And it's clear from page one in, you know, uh, well, not page one, but pretty close in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that that's, that's the case. How would somebody not have that idea? It would be because they read it in a book somewhere or a pamphlet somewhere, or in our days they watched the History Channel and saw a special where somebody was saying, yeah, the Gospels, that's the nice Jesus. 
And the church, that's been the really mean Jesus over here, right? And they, they took in some ideas from somewhere and uh, got it mixed up. And, and we could say the same thing about, like, think about the poor, right? And this stuff about anarchism. Um, do the poor really want anarchy? Um, we often get this, this picture, even today, like, well, yeah, let the poor people uh, have their say, and it's going to be chaos, you know? Like, think about voting rights, right? They want justice. They don't want anarchy. And, exactly. And, and they'll get justice by, by subversive means, but not anar anarchy is, is complete overthrow of, of, you know, the government. They don't want that. They just And who justice. does that, who can that possibly benefit? Only somebody like who's, who's powerful yep, or rich, rich enough to, to, to benefit from it. So, you know... We, we, I think we have a lot of these things where, where the appearance and right. the reality are, are kind of mixed up. Um, and Chesterton was pointing out that out in, in his own time uh, in ways that are sometimes relevant uh, and sometimes less relevant, you know. Um, this one actually is quite, quite funny, the, the, the flying in. Um, they pass a law that puts um, pubs in a weird catch-22. You're not allowed to have a sign to advertise your pub, but without a sign, you can't serve beer or liquor. So the idea is to essentially impose, um, what do we call it, a prohibition, right, in, in England on the entire um, country. But to do it by this, this legal machinery. So these guys, um, these two guys, uh, form a flying in. And flying doesn't mean flying in the air. It just means you know, going from place to place. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're these agents of subversion, but subverting uh, things back to how they used to be, um, you know, that people can actually drink. This, this, this book, by the way, got Chesterton massively criticized for promoting alcohol abuse back in his own time. They were, critics are like, you're, uh, you're actually, you know, saying that people should drink as much as they want. Oh, there's always those guys. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> here in Wisconsin, I'm sort of preaching to the choir, right? We, we have a long tradition of, um, the, the, the British have the pub, you know, as, as the sort of uh, institution. We have the tavern. And the tavern, um, many, we don't, or the, cor the corner bar, right? Um, it's, Many of them aren't like that anymore, but it used to be a place where you'd go and, and um, there were some drunks, but, but a lot of people would, you know. Um, Hang out with your buds. Yeah, and, and, and parents would bring kids in for a fish fry or things like that, and um, you could actually, it was a good place to actually observe people not drinking too much to learn how to handle your, your liquor in a way, you know. I mean, you could also see the drunks at the end of the bar, you know, <laughs> just sitting there, um, but that you know that's the sort of thing that he's he's sort of protecting and and projecting in there um so you know with 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 appearances and and realities um it's it's important to attend to what's actually there and sometimes you know we, we pass over it too quickly or we accept some reading from the media um which i think he saw as a, a big of a problem then as People do now say with uh, you know the internet and uh, proliferation of, of uh, things you know sort of timely thing there have been a lot of firings at newspapers lately right including the Journal Sentinel here in, in uh, Milwaukee and but if you ever do you, do you ever go on the Journal Sentinel webpage it's just a mess you know the ads everywhere you know. Um, I like a paper paper. I don't do it online. Yeah, and even the paper papers have gotten really thin. Oh, yeah, they? no you kidding. Know? Compared no to kidding. when... No when, kidding. Yeah. yeah. Time magazine, you pick it up. It's, it's all recycled news. Yeah, it's very very light. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe what we're getting through through all of that is, is uh, highly mediated and just sort of regurgitating the same ideas, which are uh, appearances. They're not actually getting us to the, the reality of things. Um, think about you know new, news stories and how easy it is to skew them one one way or the other you know. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, the the news media, as we've known it, is sort of curated truth. Yes. I mean, they're they're appointed or they've come into their source of power, editing power, whatever you want to call it, like as a curator. Yeah. But they have some credentials to do that, and sure, they can err on one side or the other, but I mean, um, there's some controls. Um, 
There's less you know, and less because well, the, there's, there's less, but I mean, then you go. The opposite is sort of the wisdom of the crowd. You know, yeah. Like, okay, if a hundred thousand people say black is white, does that mean okay, we've just been wrong all these years and yeah. on our color? I, you know, and and so or does somebody cure it and say, no, guys, come on, what are you thinking? Just because hundred thousand people buy into something that yeah, says yeah. it's the opposite. So you know, I, I. So we have two sort of flawed things there, right? And then, well, and then we have to seek out what we're going to look for. You know, I don't think the, the downsizing of print or of other mass media is because of the failure of the architecture of it. I think it's just been um, overwhelmed economically that people have, lump, they call it yeah. eyeballs. You're in a battle for eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. You know, whether, and who's the head of Netflix is, who's your biggest competitor? You know, in a video games, you know, how is that? Because, I mean, yeah. it's just like, it's not another Netflix. It's just, there's only so much time you can command. So if yeah, people yeah. want a quick reward and fire off their endorphins by whatever form of entertainment they get, yeah. they, and, and there's no loss, there's no restraint, there's no, what's the cost that they don't see a cost? And maybe they don't also see a reward, but I mean, they meander and they float to something that's quick and easy. Yeah. And, and, and the mass media or Time Magazine or even an old Milwaukee Journal was all about, you know, what are you going to commit to read? How many pages on a given subject matter? Yeah. And now it's like this attention span thing is just like... Well, that's huge. So, but, I, but I'm saying, yeah. I, I don't think it's, be, like you suggested maybe, it's because it was faulty at its core in terms of promoting a certain reality. Oh, I wasn't that was, saying that. Bent, but. that. I wasn't saying that was the, that was the reason for the decline. I'm saying that's a that's a function of the decline. The fact that they have less reporters, that they don't have fact checkers because they can't pay for them. No. Exactly. They don't have yeah. deep investigating reporting that they use. Journalism to has yeah. has massively declined yep. in in um, what it used to be. I mean, think about the. You know, we used to have first the Journal and the Sentinel, right? And then it became the Journal Sentinel. Remember how everyone went crazy over that? But that was still pretty good. And, you know, they, they have fewer and fewer people actually working at the Journal now. They, they recycle. They still do some investigative reporting, but a lot of what they do is just recycling Recycle. AP stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, it's too and, much competition with yeah. all this online business, you know. There's so yeah, much and, other and news sources that aren't even. But we're in a period of anarchy. So I mean, incredible. It's like you can pull it out of the book. I mean, you know, because, well, yeah, you could. You we could, don't recognize it. Maybe that media anarchy. But not anarchy. I. That's that's it. We're we're not in a position of political anarchy, but we are in a time of um, information anarchy. I think that's exactly right. You know, and that um, means ultimately truth anarchy in yeah. terms of. What is the reality? What is the better reality or the more truthful, real reality as opposed to what comes quickly? So when it comes to some of the really, really big picture stuff, we may not be able to get at the reality. When it comes to like what's happening, lo happening locally with people that we actually know, um, we're, we're, not <clears throat> we're not cut off from it. Uh, we might actually be, you know, in some respect, because of like the proliferation of social media, provided we don't just like buy into any one picture, we might actually be better off because we can we can find out more and, and like you know get the different takes and then and then form like a composite picture. But it, when it comes to like the global stuff, we're kind of screwed. <laughs> you know? It's very difficult to, to well, if tell. you listen to BBC or if even if you just put on the like Channel Ten Nightly News where they do more of a global perspective, we're so out of it here. Yeah, um, well, that's quite true too. Yeah, yeah. our our. As a nation, it's such a narrow scope yeah. of what's going on, you know, it's just ridiculous. But people, I think, yeah. still, the vast majority of people can't deal with ambiguity. And, right. and, and yeah, reason, yeah. Yeah. as a method of finding the truth and reality, is by its nature questioning and ambiguous and changing. Yeah. And faith, as we've known, any number of faiths, what does it bring to them first and foremost? Certainty. I like certainty. It well, doesn't disrupt me. Yeah. It doesn't undercut me. I can say I'm this faith, and somewhere out there, I like the rules. So yeah. give me the rules. Give me the structure. That's where somebody like Chesterton, who writes a lot about this, would say that for many people, what they call reason is really just a kind of faith. You, you see these people who get out there and they're like, you know, that's not logic. That's not reason. That's not this. And then you look at the, the, the stuff that they're saying and their commitments, they're like just as committed as some fundamentalist religious believer is 
to like almost like proof texting and things like that. And in, so this is actually a, a good thing to, well, we can talk about this appearance in reality. One of the things I wanted to bring up is this Father Brown guy, who, who I, I didn't, I, you know, I, sh- I actually should have brought that That's into like one of the reading. series on oh, yeah. still, oh, on, on the BBC. Yeah, the, BBC. Oh. the books are pretty good, because yeah. Father Brown, Christian Father is Brown is, is a, uh, he's constantly running into people who want to claim something as a miracle, and he's like, don't talk about miracles. Let's actually get to a rational explanation of things. He's the detective who's solving things, in part because he's not willing to buy into any sort of superstition about, about stuff, including the superstitions of, of some scientific people as well. He wants to approach the situation and figure out what's, what's going on, so it makes him a good detective. Now, interestingly, there's a, there's a thing that comes up in the, one of the Father Brown stories, the same thing happens in a Graham Greene story, where uh, uh, they're talking to a priest. And they, somebody asked the priest, well, how do you get these insights into human nature? He says, well, you know, I mean, I studied some philosophy and psychology when I was in seminary, but that's not really what it was. Actually, that, that kind of set me behind. It's being in the confessional. Now, why would actually sitting in the confessional make you a good judge of human nature? Because you hear people coming in and spilling their guts about all the crazy all stuff that they've thoughts. done and, and <laughs> lied about, right? And then they tell you why they did the stupid things they did. And then you say, okay, let's try not to do that you know, anymore. And then you give them you know, penance. And then they come back next week and tell you about how they did the same stupid thing, but for a different reason. You know? <laughs> and after a while, you can kind of figure out like, what people are, what you know, different types of people, and, and what motivates people, and when somebody really is ready to change things, and when when they're just giving you this line of, oh, Father, I really want to get my life back on track, and and you know, and a good confessor can be like, bullshit, you don't want to get your life on track, you're going to be here next week, you know. <laughs> um, now that would be a way to, in a way, think about what the confessional does. It cuts, it gets the person to go beyond the appearances into the reality of who they are. They, you know, I'm not saying like they're revealing their entire absolute true self, but they're revealing more of it than they reveal, say, when they're uh, with their friends at a party, right? <laughs> you know? See, a good or, confessor or, would say your penance instead of saying some silly is to just not be doing this thing. You know, come don't come back with me. <laughs> you know, same problem. Do you want to you want to hear a funny story about a priest in my my family? Um, his name was uh, Father Father John, and and we had two great uncles in my, you know, my grandfather's generation who were priests. And one of them, I think I may have mentioned this before, one of them should never have been a priest. He was kind of a ladies' man, and his mom said, we're going to put the kibosh on that, you're becoming a priest. And like, you know, I don't know what was going through his head. He was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do that. And he became a viatorian, and he was as sour as hell. You know, he'd give fire and brimstone sermons, um, and like we had a family, we have a family reunion every year. And uh, one year, you know, it was very hot. It was like 100 degrees, you know, and we didn't have air conditioning or anything, but we did have a pool. So everybody's going around in their swimsuits. He gave this sermon about how, like, you know, we're all, we're all living in sin, looking at each other in swimsuits. We're all going to, to hell. So he was that kind of A lot of, of frustration there. Yeah. Well, that's, that's <laughs> what it was, right? And now he was actually sort of a, a local legend in the Viatorian community. <laughs> Because I, I like met other Viatorians and, and I'd say, Oh, I, I you know, my uncle's a Viatorian. I'd say I'd say they'd say who? And I'd say, Father Art. And they Father Art Lamrees? Wow, he's he's like a legend for his austerity, his strictness, you know. Now Father John, he was a younger brother. He didn't have to become a priest. He wanted to become a priest. And he was sort of the you know, he was not the opposite, but he was a compliment to, to Father Father Art. And he would do things like, with my mom's generation, it was shortly after like Vatican II, he would like take a walk with them. Uh, they, they had a farm out in Indiana and that all the cousins would, would go to. Um, all, the, all the, my grandparents' generation bought this farm so they'd have a place to take the kids out of the city uh, in, in the summertime and stuff like that. So he would like say, let's take a walk. And then they'd walk along and, and my, my screw up cousins would, um, you know, tell them about what was going on in their life and how they got drunk this time and were, you know, screwing around on the job with this. And then, you know, after a while, you know, he'd say to them, is there anything else going on in your life? And they'd be like, no, I think that's pretty much it. And they'd say, okay, I'm going to give you absolution, you know. Uh, here's your penance. 
just, you know, he, he was actually sort of, uh, liturgically what he was doing was not correct. Yeah. But his heart was in the right place, you know. He was, he was leading them through uh, confession. And confession is about figuring out what, what a screw-up you are so you can, like, unscrew yourself up a bit, right? Uh, in a way. Um, and, and so Father Brown kind of fits into that, um, I, I, I would say. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about is the characters all, and this, especially the, the man who was Thursday, they all have some sort of commitment, right? And that's, that's what makes them the character that they are. I mentioned the guy who's the Nietzschean in here, or the two guys that are, want to kill each other because one's a, a, an atheist who really believes it. The other one is a Catholic who really believes it. Um, other people stand in for other things, right? So, so some people stand in for this doctrine or that doctrine, and, and some of them change, but most of them remain motivated by the same basic set of, of uh, desires or commitments, you could say, or prioritizations. Um, very often we don't know what they are until they, they, not everybody wears it on their sleeve, but you know, in the mystery stories we, we find it out as people interact, and we find out like who the real killer is. Because uh, the real killer wasn't motivated by ideology, they were motivated by wanting to make money or uh, things along those lines. That's, that's part of why I had like the Club of Queer Trades and the, uh, what was the other one I remember? The Man Who Knew Too Much. The Man Who Knew Too Much, yeah, great example of somebody. He knows too much, his life kind of sucks because he knows how bad people are because he's, he's constantly seeing how the moral and intellectual commitments that people make, which are not good ones. Um, damage themselves, damage the people around them. Um, and th this kind of fits in with, um, uh, where was that? Um, yeah, so, so in orthodoxy, right? It's got this, the Christian admits the universe is manifold and even miscellaneous, just as the same man knows that he's complex. The same man knows that he has a touch of the beast, a touch of the devil, a touch of the saint, a touch of the citizen. The really sane man knows he has a touch of the madman. But the materialist world is really quite simple and solid, just as the madman is quite sure that he's sane. The materialist is sure histories have been simply and solely a chain of causation, just as the interesting person mentioned before is quite sure he's simply and solely a chicken, a madman. Materialists and madmen never have doubts. Religious people... Uh, now, there's plenty of religious people that are like that, too, like you were mentioning, right? A lot of people want faith so they can have certainty, and uh, sometimes they actually, like, jump from faith to faith to faith, like they church hop, you know? Um, you're like, uh, I thought you were in this church over here. No, they were totally wrong. Now I'm in this church. They've got the total answer, right? <laughs> but people do that with other things, too. Like, they leave behind a fundamentalist background, and suddenly they become a, a, you know, a secular scholar, and they're absolutely sure that the Gospels are all mythical, you know? And you're like, boy, it seems kind of excessive, you know? Uh, well, it's that same disposition of the world needs to be simple. Um, and uh, these can be quite complex. And in a sane person, Chesterton seems to think they're going to conflict with each other. You're, if, if, you're, if you're crazy, your life is a lot simpler because you pick one thing and you just follow that, right? And you follow it all the way to the end. If you're sane, you have a, a whole mishmash of conflicting things that don't all fit together well. And I think for him, his religious conversion is something like that. It didn't make his life simpler. It made it more complicated. And it made his, his thinking more... I won't say confused, but certainly, you know, more tangled. Um, I mean, what do you guys think about that idea? Well, you, but if he had converted from something other than Anglican, just English Catholicism, I mean, I, I don't of. really know that there's yeah. that much difference. I mean, sure, the, you can the say the, of the, Pope, the authority right? of the Pope, but then there isn't a whole lot of authority of the Pope in most Catholic lives in general. <laughs> but, I mean, they don't. I mean, yeah. he's there, but I mean, he's... That's actually a good he's point. He's For... less consequential, he's... I for, mean, for whatever. As, for as and much so as Protestants in 1926 or whatever it is, you yeah. know, to convert, that was a small conversion to me. Because, well, I was, mean, if in 1926 yeah. you lined up, okay, what are the top five tenets of one versus the other that are really different? 
Do you, you know, know how many people get were burned at one the stake? The other, well, in the 1500s. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you know what I'm saying? When he converted. When <laughs> yeah. He converted. Well, well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you because that's, that's something started. I actually, that's something I, I wrote my dissertation on. Um, 1926 was when Action Francaise was condemned by the Vatican. Action Francaise was a very powerful movement in France that was monarchist, um, you know, sort of nominally Catholic, but claiming they, it was essentially a proto-fascist movement. And um, so, the, you know, there were some real stakes there. Uh, modernism, it was in the middle of the modernism controversy. If you were a modernist, you'd be, you know, they, they wouldn't let you write, they would uh, send you places. There was still a lot of anti-Catholic prejudice in England at the time. Graham Greene writes about this. Well, look you know. what Elizabeth the first did. For God's well, I mean, this this is <laughs> no, this is centuries after that. But yeah, the, there there was it did mean something, and um, the Anglicans were kind of a mess and a muddle. Um, he uh, and it, you know it, so it did it did mean something, but to even uphold a sort of orthodox notion of Anglicanism in a time when that meant you were considered backwards was a big uh, commitment on his part. But what did it really change in terms of what he was writing after he converted? Oh, I, I th you think there was a marked difference in his world view and things after he just did that I final... Think, no, I think it was sort of like shifting bits and pieces of it. I, I think that that's why he converted. I don't think he, he converted then suddenly changed his worldview after that. I think he changed his worldview around. And that's was was Sometimes people convert years yeah, yeah. earlier, yeah. they just don't formalize it. Like did, his okay. brother oh, yeah, converted yeah. and yeah. died in the war. Yeah. And he may have just, you know, that was 1918 or something. He might have said to And it took him, yeah, yeah. you know, like, I don't know, eight years well, later, yeah, and maybe yeah. he had the whole time saying, what did my brother see and what happened? And Well, that's a, that's a good point. You know, in, in a conversion, we use, we use the term as if it's like a, a punctual thing, like it happened at this time. Um, and then the person like went from, from A to B. But really, it, it's quite often, a conversion might take years and years and years. Think about St. Augustine, for example. You know, In the Confessions, he, he buys into this part first, and then he's like, yeah, I, I buy this, but I don't know about another this stuff over here. Right? And, what's that? <laughs> the Confessions? No, I said another very disturbed man. Oh, Augustine? Uh, well, oh, that guy's got pro had guy had problems. He's, I mean, he's working out his own guilt all he's, the way He's through. a cool saint because he's a saint that you can relate to. Yeah, he's because, working out his guilt. <laughs> well, it's not just guilt. He's, um, he was genuinely, like, throughout his life, you see this, he's motivated by the idea that there's something more, something better. And and he does have something No, but there's part, but philosophers yeah. really like Augustine. But I mean, I... Yeah. Looking at it from non-philosophical, like when I was studying more, you know, church history and yeah, theology yeah. and stuff, he didn't well, come across with crime. original He's, sin. You're talking about. well that yeah, that yeah. and other yeah, yeah. crap he came up and and just really he was working out a lot of his own mischief. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but he had mischief because he actually did things. I mean, he he, he lived. <laughs> he screwed around and had a kid and you know Stole pears. <laughs> got involved in a cult. Yeah, I mean. So, I mean, philosophers really like you know his. I bet I don't know. I just he just doesn't resonate with me very well. That's yeah, all. But, well, the point but that's was, just my opinion. The point was Augustine <laughs> took a long time to, to convert. It didn't. It didn't happen oh, yeah, it was like very, a, a yeah. single thing. One of those deathbed things almost. No, no, he. he I know it was after. Oh no, that was. He was uh, a bishop. That was Constantine. For, for, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was time, but I, I, and why, why would it take a person a long time to convert? Because the human person is complex. And again, a sane person doesn't change everything in their viewpoint all at once. It, it has to, this part has to change first, and then this part, and then this part, and then this well, part. Well, it evolves on a realm of experience. I mean, you just, you know, you yeah. have things, and then you just evolve, you know, based on whatever well, I mean, that has happened. Yeah, I mean, part of it could have been, too, one option is to say, okay, if your sense of being an anchor can is being eroded over a period of years that it's just not real for you the well, option is to say well maybe that's part of organized religion that's no, just I think it's just you know a, before he goes to another I think it's a mistake to, to frame it as like no. being an Anglican was eroded he, he for him no. I mean, no no here's, here's the thing he becomes so. a Catholic the way that that most people that that become converts from one other denomination do not because the, there's an ism that they're abandoning, but because they think that Christianity is most fully embodied yeah, in this church. Just, just, like, just like when somebody becomes leaves the Catholic Church and becomes an Orthodox uh, uh, church member, it's because they think the Orthodox Church has got a better handle on it. It's not like he rejects Anglicanism and, and says, 
uh, in becoming a- a Catholic, I abjure all Anglicanism, you know, or anything like that. Um, but I thought part of the conversion process. No, I said you no, it's not. Gold. It's you, you. You just find <laughs> something that you, you just start seeing things that are appealing and, and start speaking to you. And yeah, that's, that's yeah. the kind of the way it goes. It's not a rejection of one; it's the embrace of another. Even if he was uh, like a pagan, right? Like he'd grown up without any religion, he wouldn't have to reject paganism in order to become a Catholic. Um, he would just say, I, that's, I've left that behind. I, I, yeah. I, I think whatever they sign when they're converting would dispute that, but I mean, not that people well, I mean, read I, or read or understand everything they sign, but... No, you, you've got your whole dad thing in, in your head. But you that's don't, you don't sign anything. You don't I mean, sign I, I, was, I was accepted back into the Catholic Church. No, you don't sign anything. Yeah. What are you yeah. even speaking of? You don't. Um, well, you got to go through... Uh, Training, I mean, yeah, stuff. catechesis I mean, I mean, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You take, you, you know, when, when you're confirmed, you uh, you essentially recite the creed, which which Anglicans do every mass anyway. You know, so there's not a radical difference there. Um, but you consider because you left the faith, you came back to the, you had to be converted then, formally. I'd never gotten confirmed. Oh, so you were seeking confirmation as a sacrament? Yeah, I so got. Then, I, I left, but I, I left. Know, I, I left. I, I like but did, sort of did, made a public declaration of, of I'm done with this stuff while I was in Catholic school in high school. Okay, but you, uh, so yeah. just in terms of understanding the process, so if I don't know, yeah. you, you were anybody then, yeah. okay, you didn't do it when you were 12 years old, so now you're 24 years old or something, yeah. and you say, well, maybe I should come back and do this. So then the priest is going to say, well, what have you been doing? What have you been up to? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you kind of missed your, your boat here, and now you're back, but we'll take you. Yeah. I mean, but it depends on the priest whether he's going to sweat you about whether you really totally well, rejected everything. You just go through RCA and, and now have to make not, amends or something. It, yeah, of course. You just go through RCA and then, then you get your well, confirmed. Or, or you, you know, you, there's all sorts of different ways you can do it. Well, Christian um, did the same thing. He just got up and he says, I'm not believing this bullshit anymore. And he's in high school and he just walked right out. <laughs> you know, it, and that's. Yeah, it's a you know it's fine. I mean it, it's it either either you it works for you, or it doesn't work for you. And well, people, and, you get value and or you don't get value. I think part of the too is you you, the the thing about like his brother is probably important, right? You see you see other people, and how they approach things, and you say, well, is this any different than being within this church or not being within this church? And it makes you, again, I think conversion for a lot of people is a gradual process. You know, you don't say. Bam! I'm getting converted. You know, you you know you think about things and you mull them over and you're like, yeah, that guy over there. Like, I thought Catholics were really like backwards or something, but he's not. You know, um, and then then that that changes things over time. Um, he's got the here's another passage. This is more about about politics, but it's from a book where he explains why he became a Catholic, um, and he says. Uh, in the matter of reforming things as distinct from deforming them, there's one plain and simple principle. A principle will probably be call, called the paradox, which is why I put it here in the thing. There exists in such a case a certain institution or law. Let's say for the sake of simplicity, a fence or gate erected across such a road. Um, the more modern type of reformer goes up to it and says, I don't see the use of it, let's clear it away. To which the more intelligent type of reformer will say, if you don't see the use of it, I certainly won't let you clear it away. Go away and think. And then when you come back and tell me you do, you do see the use of it, I may allow you to destroy it. The paradox rests on the most common sense, elementary common sense. It, the gator fence did not grow there. It was not set up by some ambulance who built it in their sleep. It's highly improbable it was put there by escaped lunatics who were for some reason loose in the street. Somebody had some reason for thinking it would be a good thing for somebody to um, uh, to to uh, or, yeah, so it would be good for somebody. For somebody yeah. <laughs> Until we know what the reason was, we can't judge whether the reason was reasonable because a lot of reasons are unreasonable, right? It's extremely probable we've overlooked some aspect of the question. If something set up by human beings like us seems to be entirely meaningless and mysterious, there's reformers who get over this difficulty by assuming their all their fathers were fools. But if that be so, we can only say that folly appears to be a hereditary disease. The truth is, nobody has any business to destroy a social institution until he's, real, until he's really seen it as a historical institution. If he knows how it arose and what purposes it was supposed to serve, then he can say that they were bad purposes, or that they become bad purposes, or they're purposes which are no longer served. But if he simply stares at the thing as a senseless monstrosity that has somehow sprung up in his path, it's he and not the traditionalist 
who's suffering from an illusion. This often gets quoted for like supporting a certain kind of conservatism in politics. Not a conservatism that would be like <clears throat> any of the people that we call conservatives today. All of them would be reformers of this sort um, because they're all trying to change things. Um, very few of them are actually trying to hold on to things. But um, he's actually bringing it up in terms of religion. And he's talking about some of the things that, say, the Catholic Church had held on to that the Angl Anglican Church had gotten rid of. And that's, that's part of what he's, he's saying there as well. Maybe these things weren't, it wasn't good to get rid of them. We should have thought that through. And now notice he is saying, hey, there, there could be some stuff that you're like, yeah, we, we understand why it's there. Doesn't matter anymore. That reason doesn't apply. You know, like Chesterton, if he were around today, um, he might actually be quite more, quite a bit more liberal today than he was back back then. You know, it was, or the way we look at him as, as being back then. Um, but it's, it's not a bad idea that we should, you know, try to understand. If we're going to say let's change this, let's try to understand what it is that we're we're starting to change. Some things like uh, think about you know institutions that are that are you know. Founded in racism, like the you know the blackface thing in, in Virginia, right? And so, well, it was a different time. It was the eighties. Well, in the eighties, we knew it was wrong to do blackface up here, at least. Um, and uh, if if you know if we were going to do it, we'd expect to get in trouble. Um, but now you say, well, what was the what was the reason for doing blackface? Well, it's kind of an homage to Al Jolson. Well, that's a terrible idea, right? Um, but at least if you bring it out into the open, you can figure out what the hell it's about, instead of just saying, down with this, down with this, down with this. I think that's actually quite a, a good idea. He's, he's saying we need to actually um, make it clear what the institution is and what its reasons are, and then we can critically examine the reasons and see whether they're good but reasons. He's assuming that the two different parties can come to a common understanding of yeah, what, exactly. what, what function it fulfilled. Yeah, and, and and they have the time and the inclination to do that, as opposed to one being totally outraged, like blackface, yeah. that they just know it is so wrong. I don't have to articulate that. Yeah. It is just so wrong as racist, and if you don't get it's racist, I'm not going to sit here and educate you about removing that fence or whatever. Well, I mean, the thing is, when it comes to blackface, it's not like this is the very first time that the issue has come up. So there have been plenty of discussions about, you know, especially online, about you know how blackface arose and whether it's appropriate or not. So the fact that like these guys, um, you know, never occurred to them that maybe maybe somebody will dig in my past and find this stuff, and that I better get ahead of this. Um, they you know you could say well in the present they they suddenly are placed on the spot. Well you know it's not like this this discourse hasn't been out there for a long time. Um, you could say, like, if something new happens, radically new, and we're like, get rid of this. Um, like, what would be what would be a contemporary example where, like, something like that would happen? People um, wanting to get rid of the Electoral College. Well, people have been wanting to get rid of that for a long time, though, right? There's been a lot of discussion of, is it good, is it bad? <clears throat> um, I remember, you know, hearing stuff about that when I was a, a kid in the 80s. Um, Especially, you know, from Democrats after Reagan, Trump's Monday. But, but see, you know, to use that example, though. Yeah. And it, it's a little bit of a complex the argument or situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if somebody, two parties, came to say this is why they did it. Yeah. That's not necessarily the full picture to say what are the consequences if now mm -hmm. you did away with it. Yeah. You so know, that's a little bit. Different, sure. and that's where you get into even more complexity, more intolerance for. Well, sure. Not coming to a clear and effective now answer. He's not saying it's going to be an easy <laughs> thing to do. He's just saying this is if you want to actually like have some rational, uh, uh, you know, working through these. But things, this is like having a court for change, and we don't have a court for change very much in our. Do you know what we can do though? <laughs> it, let's say let's say that some of us actually like. Did uh, operate this way, and we and we you know we'd probably take a lot of abuse. Oh, it would right? slow things down incredibly. I mean, just like the doctors, you know, to figure it, to do no harm. I mean, it was yeah. just like okay, we're not going to change anything until we sit down calmly, collectively, with authority 
decide why it was there to begin with. I don't think he's saying it has to be that no. formal, right? But he is giving you a, a useful guideline. Um, I well, mean, I, I think, you know, if, if you say we shouldn't throw things out willy-nilly. Yeah. Just because we have the power to do so. All right, that's fine. Well, but I, I think we do more things today yeah. of harm by omission than by commission. But Yeah. You mean like... Um, what would be an example? That, that we omit to, to, to do things, that we don't pay attention to what we lose or are giving up by things because we haven't felt an immediate consequence for doing so. And yeah. so uh, we tend to think of errors and, and, and crimes and, yeah, yeah. and other bad acts as being an act, like an affirmative action to do something. And, and that's a, something of commission. We consciously, yeah. well, not always consciously, but... You commit something. You do something. But I just action. think that we have more consequential changes that are at work over a longer period of time by omission than by commission. So sometimes, there, sometimes there's a combination, right? Like we, well, sure. we, somebody else does something. Uh, like you know, um, think about how how little we actually participate in in um, what um, city government does. Like I, I I live in Milwaukee. I don't go to common council meetings, so the common council does stuff. And if I were smart, I'd actually go to them and every once in a while, like, go down to the microphone and say, uh, excuse me, I think this is a bad idea, right? <laughs> uh, or, you know, what's your reasoning for this, right? Uh, but I don't do that. And so I'm acting in omission there. Or I'm, 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 I'm not acting in omission. I'm not doing anything. I'm, uh, there's an omission. Yeah, and they but assume I, but I'm letting no one them, knows means consent. Yeah, I'm letting them uh, do an action yes. by commission. So I think there's there's a lot of cases like, like that. And then there's a lot of cases where we can't really do anything about it. Like if Amazon wants to, like, you know, you know, Amazon's pulling out of New York. Milwaukee was out of the Amazon running a long, long time ago. But let's say we want to put together a package. Um, if Amazon wants to come to Milwaukee, they will. If they don't, we, we don't have anything to do with that, right? Um, and if I, like, you know, put my, my little thing on Twitter, stay out of here, Amazon, you know, that's not going to make any <laughs> difference, right? Um, but when it comes to smaller things, I, I, I could make a, a, a difference. Um, you know, here's an interesting example. So at Marquette, they've gotten really, really strict about um, plagiarism. And academic dishonesty and it used to be in the past we could kind of uh, uh, do it informally like a student would plagiarize they'd always do it and then you'd catch them how far has it passed oh uh, this changed this year oh but they had these software programs that hunted for oh yeah yeah I mean. and, and and software programs would flag them and what I'm saying is formally means you don't go to the plagiarism or the academic dishonesty board and turn the student in Instead, what you would do is you would like you'd, you'd say to the student, you get a zero on this assignment because you plagiarized, and here's where you plagiarized from. And most of the time, I don't even need to use the software. I can, I can tell, you know, this is coming from somewhere other than the student, then I just put it into Google, and then the website comes up, because they're not very good at it, you know. And um, they, the, the thing came down from above. We are not allowed to do that anymore. If a student plagiarizes, we must... Send it to the zero tolerance. Yeah, we have to send it to the academic, uh, uh, pl the academic honesty or academic uh, integrity board. And now that's extra paperwork for me, and it also I don't like it because it goes on the transcript, whether they like even you know. Oh, just that they get referred. Yeah, and so. Well, that puts a fair guy. I don't like zero tolerance on anything. Yeah, so well, always circumstances. I, that's right. I don't like yeah. it because of the inflexibility of it, right. and it doesn't allow me to work sort of like work with the student to say, "Hey, I, I'd like to see a non-plagiarized paper from you." Mm -hmm. It just comes There's right no down to it. Here's a curious thing. Yeah, the, the recently retired uh, editor publisher of the New York Times writes her book. Oh, and now there's plagiarism. Talk about yeah, yeah. somebody who should know. Would be sensitive to all forms of plagiarism, yeah. and here she gets caught, and they're like, "Okay, I'll fix that." Well, <laughs> I don't know this. I'll, I'll, I only know the headlines. I haven't read, right, but I've seen her interview. Yeah, yeah. In the past, as this highly credible, well-esteemed person. Yeah, yeah. Know, I, that was like Charlie Rose who thousands. Plagiarism is a bigger but. problem, I think, for people higher up. I, I, you know, I went to Southern Illinois University. The um, president of Southern Illinois, when when it was Glenn Prashard, students dug into his stuff. The students in the Daily Egyptian, they found that he plagiarized massive sections of his master's thesis <laughs> and his P PhD uh, dissertation. And it came up because um, he had overseen this policy that actually 
fired a professor for plagiarizing by um, taking uh, like a teaching document and then copying some stuff from it because it was some required thing. And so the students were like, well, this seems a little uh, hypocritical, you know? Of course, he got away with it. They, they looked into it, the trustees, they didn't want to do anything about oh, it. Oh, so even once self-discovered, he didn't resign or anything? Nope. He just said... Nope. You know what he said? He said, um, you know, I think I was reading that stuff at the time, but I don't think it's really plagiarized. And so the students were like, this is line for line the same as this over yeah, here. Yeah. And then he still said, no, 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 it's not, it's not plagiarism. And because he was rich and powerful... I'll say the position of power, you can exactly. get away with more things. So... Yeah, and, and so that raises an issue too. Like, is it is it fair to punish the students in this way? You know, they're 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 you know they're essentially the lower class in the university ecosystem, right? They're as low as you can get, uh, and then professors are you know slightly higher. The people who matter, you know, are the people making the big decisions who have like you know VP of this or that after their name. Or There's an opportunity for teaching. Yeah. I mean, in, yeah. you, teaching is is more than just imparting knowledge it's showing how to deal with consequences yeah, this exactly, is going to yeah. happen and I mean teaching is broader than than that and then it offers no opportunity for that it offers no opportunity for redemption it offers no opportunity for anything else it's just that it I don't like zero tolerance yeah you know and I just never did I thought that was well awful. but Chris this isn't zero tolerance you're guilty this is zero tolerance you're you going to board to a board <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they they yeah. do the hearing. Yeah, yeah, but you got well, stuck on I, I, yeah. I would I would object to it being on your on your sense. final you still got paperwork that says yeah. you got referred, yeah. but found yeah. innocent. Well, I'm sorry that you get expunged yeah. if you're found innocent. But here's the thing: if if I send them to the board, they're guilty. Yeah. Because I've caught them. You know, I, the only the only way I'm going to send a student to the board is if I'm 100 percent sure it's it's plagiarized. Because I don't want to send a student to, to the board otherwise. I, I'm not going to do it if well, it's kind you of know, sketchy. But the administration is afraid there's too much well, casual, think, oh, you shouldn't do this anymore. I'm so not this, right, this is where it goes to the omission thing. I think, so I think the instructors, I viewed my, my uh, sanction as sort of middle of the road. You get a zero on the assignment. You don't get to redo it. And I tell you, knock it off. Don't plagiarize again. If you do it again, I'll, I'll refer you, right? Some professors really do turn a blind eye. They're like, I don't want to deal with this at all. I'll just take the paper, right? Uh, other professors will, will immediately like come down hard. I want this student kicked out of my class. Um, professors can get really bent out of shape about it, you know. Um, but even like the, I, they're going to get kicked out of my class, they wouldn't want that without them going to the board. They'd be like, I just want this student removed, you know. Um, Is, when they do these ratings, you know, student oh, do ratings, rate my so professor. Do, do they have a, a, a checklist? I said this professor referred five people this last semester. No. They don't count that in there. Right? No, you know what they, they they do is they they check like how difficult your class is, um, how you rate the class. Is it good? You know, and you know if if you what you want is actually a a rating that says the class is difficult, but he's a really good professor. Because um, that means that you're you're doing your job, and then they'll put in comments like, "Expect to write a lot of papers with this this person." Or, but can the student who's doing the rating be vindictive because they yes, see have you absolutely. met your daughter? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so have you met your daughter? Oh, th this is sort of a funny odd thing. Yeah. She she was she's a, she was oh. really hard. At, oh my God, was she bad with the ratings? But anyway. She, this this was some experimental film class or whatever or one of her art classes, but she she just gave a scathing rating. So now she's on the number ten bus, and who who shows up at the the professor that she and sits next to but her? But it's anonymous. Um, no, she knew who this was. No, 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 no. The um, when you rate the professor, yeah, I know, but but she, but the, the professor knew who this was. Okay. So she ne sat well, next to Kate. Well, he knew who she was. Oh, well, he is pretty, yeah. Oh boy. So anyway. Okay. Because <laughs> Kate would tell me this. I says, Kate, that's just brutal. And I said, Did number you? Number ten even, is a long bus with a lot of stuff. Did you ever? Okay. Yeah, the number ten. I said, Did you ever <laughs> even? You know, I I mean, I challenged a lot of what she said because I thought she you know was off the wall. Yeah. But anyway, she says, No, no, no. I'm holding my position, and and she made a good argument and all this okay. kind of thing. But now the, the professor sits next to her and now they've got this long ride on number 10 and they literally talked it through. And one side, you know, oh. her perspective and her perspective and what was actually going on. And they really became almost friends out of that. I thought that was really interesting. So, you know, that's actually a good segue back mm -hmm. into this stuff with the Chesterton. Um, when you, so you, you, can, you can have people that are like diametrically opposed. 
But Chesterton portrays them over and over again, like in, in The Ball on the Cross or in The Man Who Is Thursday. If you can see the other person as a person and, and actually engage them, and not like see them as a person like, you know, kumbaya circle, we all just, we say, oh, we're all the same. No, we would recognize that we're different from each other. We actually hold sometimes diametrically opposed positions, but we're still willing to treat each other with, you know, respect or friendship or charity or things like that, that creates an even even um, stronger bond. And Chesterton had that with, with George Bernard Shaw. I mean, George Bernard Shaw was like way on the other end of things on so many issues compared to Chesterton, but they would get together and have, have a great time arguing and, and, and fighting together. Um, and so do, so do the, you know, like the characters in The Ball and the Cross, they become like the best of friends. Um, but I think this... Do you know why? Fight or flight thing. Yeah. That maybe sometimes it's just triggered in some people's minds. I don't know. Um, you mean where start, we where we respond very quickly? And, well, or, or and I don't read the book, but yeah, I mean, just yeah. as you describe it, you yeah. know, that these two people that seem like they're on opposite ends of the world, earth or worldview or whatever, yeah, can't tolerate that the one believes what the other one does because it threatens their sense of reality and integrity. They, they're intolerant to being able to say, well, you can believe that. I, don't, yeah. I mean, we can have a rational discussion about it, and I don't feel threatened that you're going to take something away from me. But these, there's a these, lot of people... Yeah, these think, two don't have either of that. They're, they're, not, they're, not, um, they're not doing what you just described, and they're also not simply threatened in who they are by the other person's existence. But the trigger to go to fight... Yeah, I know, but the, well, they're going to fight to because they think it matters, and they that. and they live in a society which won't let you fight, which which imposes tolerance on everybody. That's part of what what um, Chester. It's sort of a cheap tolerance, you could say, right? Um, well, Simon Gregory and a man called you know Man was Thursday. They, that's the same way in the end because they're they're both. I mean, he's got the anarchist talking with, and it's almost like a <laughs> yeah. And and, and Sime, who's almost like this, you know, divine. You know, he's got himself so elevated yeah. there, and 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 they're having. You know, but they're having that. They're having that dialogue. They're they're discussing, yeah. and and it's 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 an example of coming together with different opinions, different point of views, and different things. And yet they were they they understood at some level they were friends, even though they were over here. You know, I mean, they were still had this yeah, connection they, of friendship. And it might go back to sort of a maybe Chesterton is kind of anachronistic in this. Maybe he views it as a kind of chivalry or something. You know. Um, but it is possible for us to do it in, in, in other ways. But, but I agree with your, your comment that yeah. said because the, other, the two parties don't come to blows if they can see each other as a person, as a fellow human being. Yeah. But the seeds of racism are that we don't see that yeah. other person as it, they're three fifths of a person or something. I mean, to go back to or, or not a person, or, or not yeah, a person, yeah, and, and yeah. just like you know, women in terms of being able to vote yeah. for so long. Well, they're not really. You know, among the ruling class, or just you know, whatever reason. Yeah, look at look at how much how much of a beef people have with the new slate of women in Congress. You know, I think there's a lot of people who are like. But it's, it's this failure to see them as a fellow human being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, and and yeah. and and, be, and when that gets blocked, however it gets blocked, biochemically, culturally, educated, just the people you surround yourselves with or listen to on on, on the media every day. Yeah. You know, then that is what creates the seeds of dissension. And destruction. Yeah. So this is one of the things I was going to bring up. The, the personalism is a philosophical movement, and, and Chesterton, as far as I know, never like identified himself as a personalist. It's a little bit later movement in, in like European I, and, and American ideas. Um, but I think you can say Chesterton was a personalist, and, and what makes a person a personalist is the commitment that what fundamentally you know, there's all sorts of values out there, but there's a value intrinsic to the human person that we don't want to um, reduce to any of these other values. So you're not just your job, you're not just your your social role, you're not just um, your class, you're not just this, you're not just this. You you are you are another person, and whether you live or die matters, um, even if you don't make a contribution. You know, um, I think that's something running through. His, his ideas and his work pretty pretty heavily. And, you know, it gets brought out, like what you're talking about, with, it gets brought out in two, two ways. One, one is what, exactly what you're talking about when we depersonalize somebody, we treat, or dehumanize them, right? We treat them as if they're not 
really a person, maybe they're just a threat, you know, or maybe they're just a um, thing to, to buy and sell, or um, maybe they're just, you know, if we take men and women in traditional roles, maybe they, they're just the, 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 not even person, the thing that makes my dinner, right? Um, if we do that, then we, you know, it's, it's very bad, of course, for the person who we're depersonalizing. It's also bad for us because we preclude ourselves from the possibility of actually being able to see the reality of the other person and, and uh, to, to be in a relationship with them. Uh, anything more than a superficial relationship, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's good. The, the, the last thing I was going to talk about, this, this notion of uh, distributism, he and his brother and Hilaire Belloc were influenced by, you know, the encyclical Rerum Novarum, as, as many other people were. Um, and if you, if you read the Rerum Novarum, the, uh, the Pope, Leo XIII, is, is articulating something that would be a, a different kind of social theory. Like when we talk about, you know, conservative or liberal, or, you know, we talk about economic theories with like, you know, communism way on this side and like unrestricted free market capitalism on this side and then other things maybe like, you know, uh, social d democrat in here and maybe our American system in here. Um, distributism is in a certain way kind of old-fashioned. It wants to bring back some things from the past, but it also viewed itself as a new way forward for the future. It never really caught on, <laughs> quite frankly. It was not a very successful uh, political program. But there's still people out there today, um, there's a distributist review that you can, you can see online. People are still contributing to it. Um, and then so there's still p some people into it. And the idea was that um, none of these isms were actually on track. There should be some private property, but it should be small, restricted. Um, Chesterton actually said the problem with capitalism is not that there's too many capitalists, it's not that there's, it's that there's not enough because capitalists should be small. It shouldn't be these massive industries that suck up everything else. Think about, for example, what, what um, the tech industries do. We have all this great you know, innovation happening with small companies, startups, and then what's a startup's goal? To get bought by Google, mm -hmm. Microsoft, a Amazon. Uh, it used to be in the day Yahoo, but Yahoo's kind of a, 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 you know, a, a, a goner, I think. Or um, Apple. It's been sliced and sold. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, but the seed money actually comes that these startups need. It comes from those big. It's not just. It from comes from them in part. Yeah, private. yeah. I mean, it, they. Yeah. You know, the big companies throw in. Okay, I'll take twenty percent of that. Whatever. Yes. That yeah, but the is. harvest. And then they know. <laughs> then they get in on what's actually developing. Is it going to be something material and worthwhile? Yeah. Or or that they just can control it. Yeah. So somebody else doesn't come and take away you know, the, the new way of building an electric pickup. So Chesterton would have been totally against that. He would have been, he would have been, been against there being huge corporations. He would have been against the idea of you're essentially developing a company so that you can sell it to somebody else. He, would, he, he said that, you know, and this is sort of the, the, what the Ray Room of Arm was saying too, you got to stay closer to the ground. It's called sub, you know, uh, subsidiarity. Things should be handled at the proper level and the goal of the marketplace should not be to generate, you know, more and more zeros. It should be to actually generate more and more good stuff. Um, and the good stuff shouldn't be just trickling down to, to everybody. It should be right there at the foundation so that, you, you know, you may have poor, but the poor shouldn't be living a, a really crappy life. You know, that shouldn't be what's required in order to make things work. And the idea uh, is, is you don't want to have, like, central control of everything. You want things to be controlled at the levels where they can be more responsive. I think a lot of people like that idea. Um, how to put it in practice, that's tough. He had the idea of, like, we should go back to medieval guilds uh, rather than labor unions. Like well, I don't think out. we need to do that, but a, yeah. a concept that I've used is... is uh, we talk about for-profit or not-for-profit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I use the term, um, especially with not-for-profits or non-profits, I say, you know, you should be for social profit. Yeah. And if okay. you say even corporations that we call for financial profit yeah. has an element of accountability for social profit, just like they're now okay, yeah, yeah. waiting for 
some of their social consciousness or for what they're doing to the environment yeah. or, or that they're you know not investing in tobacco companies you know all these sorts of things or that they're doing local initiatives to like big they're you know, buying local yeah. they're yeah, you yeah. know i mean they're doing all kinds of different things so yeah. you can say that some uh and now some of those are consumer uh oriented uh, companies because yeah. they, they don't want to piss off potential customers <laughs> especially yeah. customers that they say are at the vanguard and others will follow yeah so they say we're going to put solar solar cells or panels you know on our roofs and get increasing percentages of all of our electricity from you know renewable energy sources yeah and then somebody will come to appreciate that we're paying 25 cents percent or whatever more temporarily for our electricity and that will be our payback yeah. not because they're good upstanding moral people but because yeah. they view a social profit as something that's important yeah it's like I mean it's like restaurants that are serving sustainably harvested fish right um, there's and, and so there's I mean, things I'm just saying yeah there's, there's there's forms of accountability that can be placed on um, corporations that doesn't necessarily say you can't be a billion dollar corporation at some point or now. So that, but yeah, yeah. you just hold them accountable and, and as more people, I think it comes down to the customer. It's just like your your analogy to, you know, if the citizens don't ever go before the council, they think they don't care or yeah. they consent to whatever I'm doing. You know, so if more customers uh, or clients, whatever, yeah. have specifications that says I'm not going to come there because you don't you pay eight dollars an hour, not fifteen dollars an hour, and you're making no progress, you know, to get over this minimum wage problem we have and just wages or whatever the situation yeah, so is. Well, okay. but, yeah. So in some sense, I think it's partially in the hands or possibility of the consumer or the citizen or the client to make these things happen yeah. and come together to do things. Um, not necessarily that we have to wait for a government or some organization to come down in sort of a penalty uh, way of, of, of... Yeah, and I think Chester would, would agree with you on that. Yeah. Um, he, he would be happy to see that because that would be sort of, again, happening at the, the appropriate level. Um, he was pretty distrustful of governments in general. He seemed to think that like when they, when they um, did the best job, they were at, you know, at worst incompetent, you know. They I were, don't disagree with that. Yeah. A lot. I mean, I've worked with a lot of governments and I just <laughs> think they're just, you know, I, they, yeah. they, they, there is something about having a profit motive that organizes behavior and focuses them. Yes. Now, it can lead to abuses and greed yeah, and yeah, other yeah. bad things, you know, cheating and dumping and shit in the river or whatever when nobody's looking. But, you know, that you can repair. But when you don't have that driving force for why are we here, what's our mission, how do we get it done, how do we measure it, how do we yeah. get better outcomes, and quite frankly, most not-for-profits, including governments, which yeah. are not-for-profit, you know, don't have that, and they meander, and they waste, and they fail to get things done. Let me, let me run an idea past you. This is just my own sort of exper experience, but I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I've been working... Uh, in a uh, government-run school again, for for the first time in a long time, and uh, you know I worked in you know I was in the army. I, I worked in a lot of various government things, including educational things. And it's not so black and white as this, but I, I just want to say throw it out there in, in a very black and white form. Many of the people that I encounter are incredibly helpful, and in in, in you know government organizations, they're incredibly helpful. They will. Um, explain things to you, and then there's many, many as well, and sometimes many more, who are just time servers, will not help you at all, they've got the rules that, that they've got, and they're comfortable with them, and they, that protect them, and they, they wouldn't, like, they're proverbial, they wouldn't uh, piss on you if you were on fire, you know, uh, that sort of thing. And, and there's probably some people in between too, right? But my experience has been there's a lot of these and a lot of these. You, what do you think? Is, would you say well, that's no, the I, case? I, I think the sad thing is that <laughs> some governments can say we pay top dollar, we yeah. attract good people, we hire professionals, and then we let them loose. We don't micromanage them or whatever. Okay. But what I've seen, and, I, and when I say I work for different government, I, I'm, different, different. I mean as a consultant, yeah. as an outsider, you know, coming in working for them. Yeah. Um, 
not an organizational change in <laughs> these things, yeah. but just, I, so I observe these things. I unfortunately see sometimes they do hire good, intelligent, educated people, but then over a period of time, sometimes it doesn't take that long, people just sort of, I hate to use the word dumb dumb, but let's just say they acculturate themselves to what's not really required, yeah. and why bust my ass? In fact, this is like, and this can be even on an assembly line sometimes. You know, you take yeah. somebody new who's in there, who's got all these ideas, yeah. says, you know, you shouldn't be doing it that way, and you could do it better this way. Yeah. They don't want that. They say, just don't rock this boat. Yeah. And then, if that person is still too much of a burr under their saddle, they'll work to get them out. Yeah. I mean, by saying bad things or making up shit or whatever. Yeah. You know, and, um, uh, you know, I still think this that old so guy. Did this collective kept throwing mediocrity? In, <laughs> there was this guy up in Green Bay in one of those paper mills. This was like 40 years ago. Who got thrown in one of these big vats? You know, really? And, and it was a crime for a long time. And then they said, well, it's because there was a motorcycle gang in this thing, and they were stealing stuff, and he was going to turn them in because they wouldn't stop stealing stuff from uh, the paper mill. You know, but it was a violent, terrible death. And, interesting. And, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, was, it went for on for a long time. If you think about like who actually who who produces things, right? The the people who are actually it's almost like the Peter Principle, right? In the old Peter Principle, everyone rises to the level of their incompetence. incompetence, and before they get there, they're actually doing productive work, and then they get promoted, and they're no longer doing it. You've got the conscientious people, and they're doing way more work than they need to be doing. And then you got the people who are just time servers. And it's not like they're not doing any work. They are like, you know, because they'll get fired if they don't do any work. 80-20 principle. 20, What's that? 20 oh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the Pareto principle. 80% of the work. 80% yeah. of the people do 20% of the work. Yeah. But there are other people who come to, say, government employment. Yeah. Particularly because they don't want to have that um, just un unending, as they would see it, uh, sense of responsibility to produce and to be engaged and yet they'd rather have sort of even if they take a 20% less salary or something they think at the outset they'll think but I will have my job Secured. defined right here yeah. on this piece of paper yeah. and when somebody asks me to step out of this I say no this is what I'm here for so even though you're underwater and you're buried because something's yeah. happened and I could certainly help you out you're not going to yeah not yeah. easily yeah not easily. They should hire you an assistant. They shouldn't come over to me because, yeah, I'm just pushing things around here. I mean, so it's yeah, unfortunate, yeah. but because it's not what I call actively managed. Um, and But this is some of that goes right back to human nature, too. I mean, people, some people are hungry for information and knowledge, and others just see that as I paid my 18 years in school and now I'm done. And I'm just, whatever. Yeah. Well, I, I know that I'm looking at this. We're, yeah, we're almost we're, out of time. Yeah, they're going to kick us out in two minutes. Are they really? Okay, yeah. Leave so you we 10 should, minutes we to should wrap up. <laughs> and uh, excellent discussion, as, as always. I'm glad to see you here, too. Um, and uh, and so next, <laughs> next time, it's uh, Mary Shelley. We're doing Frankenstein, but I, I put in a few other uh, lesser-known things mm -hmm. as well.